I'm glad you're here. Today on the Deepening Place podcast, I'm talking to Michael Vilches. He's going to tell the story of his redemption, what motivated him to change, and how he now uses what he learned to help other men who are trying to find a path to healing and wholeness. I hope you're doing okay during this time. We're living in a crazy time right now with the coronavirus and social distancing and everybody's staying in their homes and a lot of people are suffering for a lot of different reasons. So I hope that you're hanging in there and I hope that this story will bring a little bright spot to your day. And as always, I really appreciate you being here. Hello, and welcome to the Deepening Place podcast. Today, my special guest is Michael Vilches. He is the founder of Man Under Construction. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi, it's good to be with you, and, and such an honor and privilege to be a guest on your podcast. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here. Your bio on your Instagram account says something about a journey to, to true manhood. Can you Tell everybody a little bit about what you do, what your vision is for your work. Yeah, of course. Uh, the journey to true manhood, by the ty- by what it says, a journey, uh, it's obviously a trip, you, a destination. You have to go somewhere, a process you have to go through to true manhood. And what the man under construction is, is looking at all the bumps in the road and all the distractions and everything. Let's say you're on a journey, you're on a road, there's distraction, there's si- there's stores, there's signs, there's landscape. And on that journey, you see all these things. And that's what man under construction is. It's going down the road to discover true manhood and stopping at every little place on the road to discover what each individual situation that comes up, what's the meaning behind it, mm-hmm. what it stands for, uh, how I, I can apply it to my life. And that's really what Man Under Construction is all about. I, it's, it's my story uh, of overcoming several things in my life. And I'm sharing these things because I, as I prepared myself to to start Man Under Construction, I realized that I'm not the only guy searching to be a true man. And that is something that we've lost along the way through uh, for the past few decades that's basically, in, in a little nutshell, that's what Man Under Construction is all about. Yeah, I notice on your on your Instagram and um, several places, I see that you talk about a real man or a true man. What what does that mean to you? A true man or a real man? In my, of course, this is my perspective, but I think a true man is a man who is healed, who is whole who has addressed his wounds. And that's not, I'm saying that they, that he's perfect. A true man is never perfect. No man is ever perfect, but has taken the time to do the inner work and address the wounds that shape his decision, decisions in, in his life. Uh, a quick example, I'll use my life. You know, I, uh, my father really, really wasn't around and, and that abandonment, that uh, neglect affected every choice I made after that. It affected how I saw myself, how I viewed myself, how I interacted with women. And it wasn't until then, that, until I realized that I had to really address that part of my life, uh, forgive my father, whether it's forgive my father, confront him, talk to him, heal from that wound and start to become whole. And, and that's what I really mean by true man and, and real man. I think a real man is someone who is whole and has, a, has, a, has dressed his wounds. He's not bleeding all over his family himself by lashing out or reacting in certain ways because of issues that he hasn't dealt with. And and that's what I, I think that's what a real man is. Yeah. I love that you say that a lot of the sites that I've seen kind of have a different definition. It's more of a, like someone who feels threatened by this idea of masculinity getting away from them and they want to just defend that ideal. I love that you're taking it inward you're being accountable for yourself and your wounds. And then from that place of healing, you're offering yourself to the world, to your, to your family, and then even outward to other men who want to be on this journey as well. Yeah. And, and I, I feel, and I, I believe it's really important because well, like I said, we base decisions on prior experiences. And if our prior experiences are wounds that haven't healed or wounds we haven't addressed, we make decisions based on that. 
how we, we, we interact with our family. It could be something as simple as having an overbearing mother or, or a mother that took care of us. We search for, when we go out into the world as men, we don't search for a woman, but rather someone to replace our mother. Mm -hmm. And it all comes in, into play. It all comes into play. Uh, if we don't address what's going on on the inside, the outcome of our present day is going to shift dramatically. I believe 100% that we should focus on the inner man. I think if we started off there, men would be a lot better off. And, and like you said, and I'm very, I'm very well familiar with these pages that offer tips on masculinity. It's usually exterior facets of masculinity. It's the alpha. It's the power, the strength. It's what appeals to many of the men that consider that feel that they're weak or that they need to focus on their strength. It feels more like a focus on the ego, strengthening ego, not balancing that with, with the inner work. The healing. That's a hundred percent. And and usually, and I have said this, I say this on my podcast and I share it out there. You can't build a strong structure without a strong foundation. So if you bypass all the inner work and you start focusing on strength and ego and pride, you're going to end up with a imbalance in those areas. You're going to be arrogant and you're going to misuse your strength because you're, you didn't harness wisdom to be able to use the strength in the right proportions. And you're not harnessing the, the love aspect of yourself. So you're going to abuse these exterior traits of masculinity. And that's what I find a lot out there. And I, I try to call it out uh, once in a while on my post. But yeah, 100%. We, there's an imbalance in what we focus on as far as the content that's available to men. And that's one thing that I want to do. I want to bring a balanced perspective. I want to explore every aspect of manhood, not just the strength, not just the leader, the protector, the provider. I want to delve into the lover aspect of ourselves because we certainly need to love our family and our children. Yeah. And love does require some strength. Love requires understanding, compassion. So those are things that we don't focus on a lot. And man, that's what Man Under Construction is all about, exploring those. I'm not familiar with every aspect of manhood. I'm still learning. Yeah. But what I do know, I want to explore. Like you said, like I said, it's a journey and I want to stop at every pit stop on this journey to explore every facet of our masculinity and manhood. Yeah, I think that's really amazing. One of the things that I really love about following you is is your humility. And that's an element that's really missing in so many places now, like even with, you know, building your online presence and you know, building a business and becoming a man, we forget that wisdom comes after some form of humility. Like you, you have to take everything you know, and then like submit it to love or healing. And then then you can emerge with with true wisdom. Yeah, 100%. And actually, it's funny that you say that, because uh, I was working on a post actually, like a couple minutes before we jumped on here. And it was exactly that. It's, um, let me pull it up here on my phone. I don't want to misquote the, my, my own post. I'll misquote. You don't want post. to misquote yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me see what we got here. Okay. It says, I never ask for power. Power is only given to those who are prepared to lower themselves to pick it up. And I thought that I ran across it. And I thought that was powerful. When I read this in my mind went back to the old days when a king or a father, when a father would pass on his inheritance, the power, the legacy of the family, it wasn't given upwards. It wasn't passed up. The son knelt by his father and the, the, the father would give it down to him, would pass it down to him. When you think about kings, when, when people would come before him, he would kneel and the, the king would knight him. Or if he was going to give a blessing, the individual, they would kneel before the yeah. king and he would hand down this blessing. When I saw that, it really resonated with me. True power comes with those who are willing to humble themselves, to kneel before someone higher than them, higher than themselves, and receive that power. And then I, I, I delved a little deeper. I took that aspect a little bit better. So, so what is the art of humbling yourself? What is the art of kneeling? Well, if we look at it physically, as a man, when we kneel ourselves physically, we put ourselves in a very, very precarious position because we can be overtaken physically. Yeah. So if we if we don't uh, let that go and make ourselves vulnerable, we won't receive that power. Not necessarily that we are weak, but we put our defenses down. And also emotionally, when you think of, of kneeling, it's a form of surrender. When you kneel before someone, it's like you're giving yourself, you're putting your, your guard down, you're opening yourself 
emotionally. And from the spectator's perspective, this looks like a sign of weakness. But from the person who's kneeling, he knows full well that I got to go through this process in order to get to the next step of where I'm trying to go. So I might have dug deep in just that little quote that I ran into, but I, f I felt that that's what it was speaking to me. And there's so much power, like you said, in humility. Yeah, I like that. And, you know, one of the reasons I follow you and some of the other accounts that are really focus more on men is because as a therapist, I work with a lot of men and I can glean a lot of insight from you guys. And so I appreciate your work for that reason too. But one thing that I, that I tell men is that you have to be willing to expose your vulnerability. And I think people are taught just the opposite, but it's that, that humility that you're talking about, allowing people to see see all the different parts of you is a way that people can build trust. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And everything you just said is, is all part of masculinity. It's all different facets. It's not all of it is pretty and not all of it is something that we want to dive into. But if you want to be whole men, not perfect, not to be confused with perfect, but if you want to be whole and really be a positive force, uh, we, we've got to focus on, on every aspect including yeah. vulnerability. And that exposing your vulnerability starts with with you, starts within, because I feel like what you're saying is that some people aren't allowing themselves to see. They don't allow themselves to see their wound. They don't they don't want to go there. They just want to plow through and, and try to make it okay. But it sounds like what you're saying is the path toward healing and wholeness is allowing yourself to stop at these pit stops and examine Maybe, like you said, your mother wound or your father wound or how you've been hurt in the past and, and unpacking that and working through it and allowing it to heal. It's, it's important that we do that. It's important that, we, that men do that. And it's not pretty. And it's not nice. And it's not fun. It's not an amusement park. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work of, of searching, a lot of pain that you have to go through. But from my from my journey, if I if I may share a little bit of my story. Sure, uh, I would love that. At this point in time, when I find myself, if I look inside, I feel myself more confident. I feel bold in what I do. I feel secure in my masculinity and my manhood. And, and I'm confident in myself. I'm, I'm confident that I can lead with wisdom. I am by no means perfect. <laughs> Just ask my yeah. wife. <laughs> just, just call my wife up and she'll, she'll, she'll let you know how imperfect. She'll give a give a witness for that. Yes, and, and you know my family, and I, I've screwed up so much, and I still screw up, and I will continue to screw up. The, the point is is trying to to work on yourself to get to a point where you acknowledge your mistakes and you quickly correct them, mm -hmm. you quickly work on them. So to share my story aspect of it, I was a, you know my 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 father did he was there but not there my parents went through a divorce he wasn't really there for me a lot of disappointment abandonment so uh, around adolescence i was introduced to pornography and to kind of give a, a summarized version i went through i i took in this this material this explicit material and it started to define who i was it started to define what a man is how a man interacts with a woman this is what i thought being with uh, my spouse or being you know, with my future wife at that time when I was in my teens, this is what I expected in a relationship. And it warped everything that I was thinking and it consumed my every thought and it's, it destroyed a lot of parts of me. Just being, just for the fact for being so consumed by it, you lose so many lessons from life. That's all you think about. You can't focus on anything else. So to go on several years, uh, I was addicted to, uh, 20 plus years. I was tied to that. So to go back in time, uh, I did go through my teen years and it wasn't as rabid as it was in my twenties, because obviously I'm 39 right now. And on my teen years, it was 1995. Uh, internet access wasn't still at what it was today. You know, we still had flip phones and you had to work harder to, to, to yes, get access to exactly. it. Exactly. But, in my heart, I still want, like, I still was still searching for it. I still wanted it. But as soon as the boom for uh, internet access came out, the, the addiction ran all over the place in my life. And it bled into my first marriage. And in that first marriage, it destroyed trust. It destroyed the self-image of my ex-wife. 
it destroyed, like I said, destroyed the marriage. It ended in divorce. I, because of my addiction, I lost access to my daughter, not in the sense that I couldn't see her anymore, but the simple things in life that we take for granted. I, I couldn't tuck her in at bed every night, yeah. call her, say, you know, say good night to her, kiss her on the forehead. I, I, I did that to myself because of my addiction that was taken away from me. And um, I'll jump a little deeper. And this is something I, I don't hesitate to say it, but it just, I'm very ashamed of it. You know, it, it happened and it's not something I'm proud of, but my thirst for more in the thing with pornography, it always asks for more, just like any other vice, it asks for more. So when the images and the videos didn't do enough for me, I, I ended up going outside the bounds of marriage and I engaged in, in a, re a relationship that destroyed was the nail in the coffin in the marriage. So there I was, I was divorced, lost access to my daughter in the sense that I, I told you about, I was alone, everything lost. I lost everything. I had nowhere else to go. I was at my mom's house trying to pick up the pieces. And I tried at that time. This was four years ago. I'd say maybe five. Four to five years ago. Four to yeah. five years ago. Yeah. You're kind of at the bottom of the barrel at this point. You've lost yes. everything. I've lost everything. And, and of course, uh, for fathers out there that can relate, you know, your daughter is everything. You know, she's your little princess, daddy's girl. And that was one of the things that hurt me the most. Because as adults, you know, it hurts. Divorce, it's, it, it's not good. It hurts. It destroys a lot of stuff. But, you know, we're grown adults and we can we can overcome. But it's the children who suffer the most. And that's one of the things that hurt me the most. And so that was one of the driving forces of why I had to change. I wanted to be the best father. Yeah. It sounds like you're kind of at a point where a lot of people are when they come to see me at the bo bottom of the barrel. They've lost everything. And one thing that I try to help people do at first is to, to see clearly. And that's one thing I was curious about. Um, what was like your matrix moment? How did you wake up from this illusion? What happened to you? My matrix moment. Well, when I realized that I was the chosen one, when I was Neo. Yeah. Know, just, <laughs> when Morpheus showed up at my doorstep. It all started I, to make sense. Uh, yes. It, they said to follow the white rabbit. So that's what I decided <laughs> to do. <laughs> I'm a fan of the series, so I know some of the references. Yeah. But I do feel like a lot of people are, are living like that. They're just totally asleep and they're just like running that program. And so it sounds like with your total entrapment to pornography that you allowed it to take everything from you, it sort of kind of goes with that metaphor. So what was that Morpheus moment for you? How did you break out of that? Well, when Morpheus introduced the red pill or the blue pill, that moment, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually... When I lost everything, that was the moment that I realized, okay, this is where I get my act together. And to, and to some extent, it did. Yeah, I had to fend for myself, get back up. So I started doing that. I started doing a little bit of work, uh, trying to build myself up, trying to get back up. And then I, I you know, as time passed on, I met an, another young lady and uh, who is my wife now, who is amazing. And she'll probably listen to the podcast. So I'll just say that she's amazing. I love her. Um, I met her. We, we started dating and whatnot. We eventually got married. And uh, at that point, I, I was fighting off my porn addiction just out of sheer will. I didn't want to do it. I know what it had done. And I was fighting it just out of sheer will, just mm -hmm. cold turkey. Willpower. Willpower. Just on my, uh, you know, on my own, trying to just beat this thing. So we, we were maybe a year in into a marriage. And... Uh, the way I would conduct myself and the way I would communicate with me, women was in a flirtatious way. And I would uh, message them, not anything explicit, but I would welcome messages with other females or whatnot. And I realized that I was repeating the same process again and, and actually leading to the point where I was about to repeat history again. You, you know, saw yourself another... getting, getting close to going down the same path. Yes. And my wife saw that and she, and she was, obviously she wasn't happy about it. And of course I felt, man, I'm, I'm leading down, I'm going down the same road and I'm about to destroy another marriage. So that was that point. I was like, I'm about to do this again. And I can't do that. I can't do this to myself. I can't do this to my daughter and my wife, you know, she's stepmom. And so the relationship had, had started and, uh, they, they love each other now. Well, not that they did then, but they, yeah. the relationship was, was formed and I, I really had to slow down and think outside of myself. 
So it was at that was that moment, that moment right there when I was about to repeat history all again. And I thought of my of my daughter and I thought of what I was doing. That's yeah, that's not, when Morpheus showed up. Yeah, that's not the direction you wanted to go. That leads very nicely to the next thing. Like once somebody can see and they say, wow, yes, that's the life I want. I don't want to go back to the to what I've been doing. At that point, you have to work really hard to learn to manage your mind and emotions. So how did how did that start for you? What did you now, do at that point? And this is a mistake that I see with a lot of guys. They want to tackle everything all at once. All at once. They want yeah, every issue, boom, put a Band-Aid over it, let's get it done. And unfortunately, that's not the way it works. And I learned that because I was about to repeat history all over again. So I really, really slowed down. I was like, why? First of all, why do I feel the need to communicate with other women? So I took that issue. So I started d diving into books and I was, uh, man, I got to beat this. I got to overcome this. I got to, I want to be free from this. I want to be able to see life not tainted by these images. So I, I started getting into some literature and, and of course I, I started praying and, and for strength and, and wisdom to proceed. One book, I ran into one book and this was really the game changer for me. This is really when I decided to take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole. And he was dealing with pornography. And this is where that's that was my starting point right there. I got to beat this because okay. if I can clear my head, I can think about other things. So the for you, the addiction was first. You had to get that yes. in under control. I had to overcome it in order to be able to think clearly. It said in this book to analyze what I would watch, to look back into the scenes that I would watch. And this is, of course, very uncomfortable. Like, who does that? You know, who does yeah. look at scenes and like, what's the dialogue? What's the interaction like? You know, those are weird things to talk about. And it is strange. And at first I was like, that is really weird. But I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. It was over the course of a couple of weeks and thinking about this, I thought about it because obviously you, you watch what pleases you. You watch what you want to watch. During this process, I realized that a lot of the stuff that I would purposely choose, that I would choose, had to do with the woman always affirming the guy. The woman always letting him know he was doing good. You, you know, whatever the dialogue is, and you know, yeah, yeah. he's, you know, yeah. oh, you're a great lover. You're pleasing me, this and that. And you can, you can imagine all the other stuff that goes on. Yeah. And on and on. <laughs> and, and on and on. It was constantly affirming the guy, making him feel like a man. So, so I took that. I was like, why, why do I need to, why do I need to be affirmed? And, and not just affirmation, but affirmation from a woman, because obviously we're going to this and I'm hearing this from a woman. So I realized that I was searching for female affirmation throughout this whole process. And I was, and well, why am I searching for female affirmation? And then I went deeper and I was like, well, because I never had any male affirmation and all I grew up was with my mom. So there was no, there was no balance between the affirmation from either parent. So that's, that's one thing I was constantly searching for, for a woman to tell me I was doing good. I was, it led up to the point that, man, you know, it, this all started right when my dad got divorced and I turned to my mom for everything. And she wow. became my hero. She, you know, and, and moms do the best that they can with the hand that they're dealt. And they do an awesome job. That's not to say that they don't, but they're not equipped to fill a father role, no matter how hard they try, they can, uh, you've heard the saying iron sharpens iron, right? Yes. The only way iron is sharpened is by another man, iron sharpening iron. And I didn't have that sharpening. I didn't have that affirmation. I didn't have that calling out by another man to step into manhood. So I sought it. And, and this was my way of trying to cope with that, you know, pornography, other people yeah. turn to drugs, turn to gangs, but until you find the source of why you're using those things. Until you go straight right to where the blood is coming out of your heart and realize why it's happening. That's when the true healing begins. At least that's how it began for me. And I say pornography, pornography because this, is, this was my coping mechanism. Yeah, that was your particular manifestation. Yeah, and for, other, for other people, it can be jumping from, for other guys, it can be jumping from women to women, trying to conquer women over and over, searching for women to define their masculinity. And it usually ties back because a father didn't call them out into manhood and affirm their masculinity. That story brings to mind for me is in working with men sometimes, we talk about the difference between the immature masculine and the mature masculine. And okay. in the 
immature masculine, the highest good that you can get is to be a good boy. And that's really related to the mother. And at some point, you know, in history, you would have an initiation rite where you were forcibly cut off from more of the mother affirmation and then led into the to the, the manhood side of it. Mm-hmm. And um, in our modern society, I think that we sometimes lose that. And it sounds like that immature masculine was allowed to continue on for you. And if your highest good is to be a good boy with your mom, you know, you really worked hard to, to do that. And then it may be carried on. But the mature masculine is the king with a vision. And it sounds like through your death and resurrection into this new life, you've become a king with a vision. And you can see what you want for the people in your realm, like your your daughter and your, your wife and, and the men that you minister to. You have a, a strong vision for them. Yeah. And, and the way you said it, uh, as far as that just that is perspective I hadn't heard, the highest you can be is, is a good boy. And that's that's 100%. And that's 100%. And a lot of times... These, these guys that grew up in a just single parent home, mom raising them, they just transfer one from one mother to another and just change the title to wife. Yeah. And I've heard so often that men who carry that mother wound, they look for someone who can fulfill that for them. And they're so happy to find it. But then in the end, they end up despising her for being what they originally wanted her for. Yeah, exactly. Because they 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 essentially wanted the the new person or the new the the new quote unquote mom to define their masculinity, yeah. and they and they can't do that, so they end up frustrated. But they don't know why they're frustrated. I've seen you post a lot about this. You know, you're stuck in the immature masculine, demanding that you be affirmed, when there's really nothing to affirm. You haven't earned the respect of being the leader, so to speak trying to get something from somebody, but you're not giving them what they need in order for them to give that affirmation to you because you're stuck in the immature masculine. And and I'm not sure this is what you were alluding to, but uh, I've shared this a couple of times. I've shared it in uh, in other podcasts as well. Like now that I've, and I'm still in like that, hence by the title man under construction, I'm still under construction. But the things that I have picked up, like in, in terms of a relationship between me and my wife, and this is something that's new to her too. She she's always had to be the strong one, and and pick up the slack. Of course, she has a, a checkered past, like many of us do. We're, yeah. we're all broken people, so she had to fend for herself. So I come into this picture, and I'm working on myself, and and we start to bump heads because she's used to being the alpha. Yeah. And I'm over here trying to step up into being the alpha, but I notice that. As I start to embrace these different aspects of masculinity and manhood, the leader, the the king, the warrior, the lover, I, I I'm starting to learn how to harness these to harness these things and balance them out and know exactly what to pull out depending on the situation. And I thought about this. I, I actually I, I posted it a while back ago. When a woman is safe enough, or she feels safe in, in the environment that she's in with her man. She will lower her guard or she doesn't have to be strong. So if I'm, if I'm secure in my masculinity and I'm using it rightfully in a mature way, in a wise way, she is free to lower her guard and be the feminine that her deepest desires long to be. This might kind of illustrate it, but it's like, I don't know if you've ever tried to learn to dance. Just recently, somebody was trying to teach me to do the two step. And he's probably I tried to dance and it went horribly. Yeah, he was like 90 <laughs> years old and just like oh, a man. rock star dancer. And he was pretty firm with me. And he said, you know, you really have to surrender. He said, I want you to hold my right hand and I'll tell you everything you need to know with that with that hand. And sure enough, I just completely <laughs> surrendered. And with that, just the most the tiniest little pressure, he's leading me all around the dance floor. And I thought, you know, we have to know the same steps. We're listening to the same beat. But it's just that really subtle difference of me being able to to relax into mm-hmm. that leadership that made this really beautiful experience happen. And, and it is beautiful. When when and a couple is in, in sync like that, it is amazing. It's beautiful. And I can say that from experience. And spe- but the, the, here the thing is, like you mentioned your dancer, uh, your dancing partner that was showing this, when, when a man does it, in the right proportion, in the right way, in a loving way, 
not with arrogance and pride and aggression, but from a whole place, from a place that he's secure in who he is. He doesn't have to overcompensate for any deficiencies. The woman feels safe to surrender. She knows that she can lower her guard and he's going to take care of her heart and allow her to be that princess without stepping on her, without taking advantage of her. And it's, I, th I feel it's, it's the way it's meant to be. I don't know if, if you agree with this or not, but I feel like that is a very special, intimate relationship. And that doesn't mean that that's the relationship I have with, say, every man. Like in business, I'm I'm toe-to-toe -to -toe with this person. Yeah. But in an intimate, loving relationship, that that surrender can be a really beautiful thing. And no, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is in the confines of, of the person you love. And yeah, definitely. And just to reinforce what you said, 100%. Like I always uh, like to use this, this analogy from a guy looking, like when I say a woman is feminine, that doesn't mean that she's weak. That doesn't mean that she right. can get stepped on. And I use this analogy because I think they did a really good job. You might not like the movie, but they did a really good job portraying a fierce woman who embraces her femininity. And it's Wonder Woman, the recent one that came out. Oh my gosh, that's my favorite. I first of all, I mean, she's she is a beautiful woman. I will admit that, but not as beautiful as my wife. So she's listening to you're more beautiful. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But um, gosh, we could have a whole episode on Wonder Woman. Seriously. Well, I'd love to if if uh, you'd have me back. That'd be a real honor. Uh, but I just love the way they they harnessed the fierceness of a warrior and embodying it, and it was covered up. In, in just delicate, beautiful femininity. But you didn't doubt that she was fierce. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The thing yeah. I loved about that is that's a great illustration of a partnership. She was on this island, you know, shut away. And she had all this power, but she didn't really know how to be in the world. And so she partnered with this man who knew exactly how to be in the world. And he kept reminding her of who she, she was. Like, I know who you are. And I don't want you to get distracted with this. There's something bigger. And so she allowed him to lead her to mm -hmm. the big thing that ended up saving the world. Otherwise, she would have gotten distracted with saving the little babies in the trenches. So yeah. it was the partnership that they had together that allowed you know them to, to actually save the world. So I thought that was a wonderful analogy. I hadn't thought about that aspect with uh, the, the guy she, she ends up with. She does yeah. surrender. She does surrender to him, but also he doesn't abuse that power. I thought that was a that was a great metaphor for for intimate love. Cool. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today, and I think the best interviews always end with with wanting more. Like I wish I could talk to you for another thirty minutes. So one thing I wanted to do is read something that you wrote, um, just to kind of wrap it up and let people know your heart. So. You said on one of your Instagram posts, I decided to forge a man out of the rubble I was. I still have much more to learn, but as I grow in understanding, I see my purpose. I see what I am called to do as a man. I'm not suggesting purpose is easy to find, but it is there for all of us. Most of the time it's hidden behind wounds, secrets, double lives, resentment, rejection, brokenness and zero confidence. The more I let go of these afflictions of my heart, my vision has cleared. I see the father I need to be. I see the husband my wife needs. I see my life as an example for others. I see what I need to do, and I'm doing it. I am a man under construction. I thought that was really beautiful. Wow. <laughs> I've never had something that I wrote read back to me. I'm always... Like, wow, I wrote that? You wrote that. And I wrote the get out of here. I was, I was like, man. That well, is, is a vision right there. And that, that will take you a long way. Vision, you know, surrender to love. That is the power that can change the world. And I really appreciate you doing what you do and being who you are. Well, thank you so much. It was an honor just to share this. And, and I hope the, your community or the people who listen to this can really draw from it and be inspired that. They don't have to be stuck in that place, that there is a better way. There is a calling on every man, even though you may not feel it at this moment, you are destined for greatness. I, I was that man and I'm still working through it. I was that man in the rubble and I'm still clearing some bricks off trying to forge this man, yeah. but it is there. And, it, and, and you're saying it's worth it. A hundred percent. 
a hundred percent. And if I can take just one minute to say, when I found a lot of the men that reach out to me and they say, how can I work on my confidence? How can I work on this? How can I be more this or that different aspects of masculinity? I always say, work on yourself first. Yeah. Same work here. on yourself first, because once you, you become whole, these attributes become natural. And that's one thing I've noticed in myself, like being able to be the leader and uh, being you know, good father, husband, it seems a little more natural coming from a whole place instead of a wounded place. It's, it's absolutely necessary. I tell people, you know, Whitney Houston said, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so true. Starting there and, and becoming that good parent to yourself, learning to love yourself the way you were meant to be loved. Then it just flows out of you to your daughter, to your wife, and to the rest of the world. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So before we leave here, can you let people know how they can contact you if they'd like to? Uh, yeah. I'm most active on Instagram, which is man under, at man under construction. But there's an underscore under each word, under man, under, and construction. There's an underscore. Unfortunately, under man under construction was taken, so I had to improvise. <laughs> but um, you can find me there. I'm most active there. I, d- I just opened a Facebook Facebook page, Man Under Construction. But you can, everything that is accessible for my platforms is on the link in Instagram. I just opened a YouTube channel, which I hope to do more of and share the story that I just shared with you guys. I want to get my, excuse me, I want to get my story out there, uh, hopefully grow in that platform as well. But I have that. And I, I launched a Patreon, which is pending. And I know I've had some people ask how they can support so as soon as that launches, I'll let everyone know. This is my passion. This is what I want to do. And unfortunately, it does take a little funds to get the stigma rolling. So I'm hoping people can support in that way. Yeah, I can attest to what you're doing. You you have an incredible work ethic because I, I work full time and I'm trying to post and do these podcasts and, and you're just posting like crazy. And I always think, wow, he is really working, keeping the candle burning on both ends. So during lunch, I'm like, Every little free time I get, I try to throw something out. Yeah, you're doing a great job, and, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Hopefully, we'll talk again sometime. Hopefully, we do. Bye.